and get started. We still have a few people signing in, but um, just to kick off the evening, we want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we are going to be talking about bears and turkeys. So um, for those of you that have joined us in the um, the previous Zoom sessions, we've talked about how to read the, the rules and information booklet. We've talked about the draw odds reports, how to apply hunter education. Um, and so now we are changing the series a little bit and we're going to be talking to a lot of our biologists, um, our big game and, and upland game biologists from across the state so that we can learn a little bit more about the draw process and how those species are, are handled in the draw, as well as tonight we're going to talk about some over-the-counter opportunities as well. Um, so thank you guys all for joining us. Um, for those of you that are joining us on Zoom, we do have the question and answer box open, so feel free to type in a question there and I will either type a response or we will answer that question live in the webinar. Um, we also have the chat going, so feel free to, to punch in any questions into the chat as well. And for those of you that are on Facebook, if you type in your, your, your uh, questions onto Facebook, we will do our best to keep track of those throughout the evening. So um, a quick introduction of everybody. So Casey, do you want to introduce yourself and then Rick? Sure, sounds good. Um, so hi everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Casey Cardinal. I am our uh, resident game bird biologist. So my position covers turkey and then a lot of the non-migratory game birds and harvestable tree squirrels. Um, and so yeah, ho hopefully we get some good information about turkeys tonight. <laughs> and I'm Rick Winslow, I'm the bear and cougar biologist and basically in charge of putting together management plans for both of the species and to look at harvest limits and update your harvest limits for both species and see what we can do as far as harvesting these animals and hunting them in general. Awesome. All right, so we can uh, just jump right on in here. Um, so Casey, I, I know you were out in the field <laughs> wrapping up some surveys, so we'll start talking about turkeys and um, that way Hopefully we can get you um, some miles and hopefully you can get home here in the near future. But um, no <laughs> what, let's just start with a general overview. What type of turkeys do we have in New Mexico? Sure, so there are, they're all wild turkeys, but wild turkeys are divided into subspecies throughout the United States um, and even down into Mexico. And so New Mexico has three of the subspecies of wild turkey. The most common one, is the Miriam's turkey, and that tends to be related to mountain ranges in the state. Um, the, the next most prevalent one is the Rio Grande wild turkey, and they tend to be associated with river valleys uh, in New Mexico. And, um, and then we finally, finally, the smallest population uh, is the Palencia, or, or the Gould's turkeys, and they are only down, found in the boot heel of New Mexico, primarily in the Palencia Mountains and the Animus Mountains. So. so we have a pretty good range of turkeys out there, and there are opportunity to hunt all three species. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So two of them are over the counter or in the draw, and that's the Miriams and the Rio Grandes. Um, the Goulds, since they are so small of a population, it's um, actually still on the state threatened list. And so um, there's not a whole lot of opportunity to hunt Goulds. There are two tags uh, offered through the governor's like enhancement licenses. And enhancement licenses are actually really cool. The money that's raised either through a raffle or an auction and enhancement tags uh, goes back into management of the species. So we use all that money into Gould's turkeys research and management um, so that hopefully we can uh, help improve habitats and manage the turkeys and maybe get them off the threatened list someday. So. Fingers crossed. And you are just down there wrapping up the survey on Gould's turkeys. So um, yes, sure. <laughs> it sounds like you saw a lot of turkeys, so that's a good thing. It is. I mean, uh, they've been serving the, the Gould's turkey since the 19, well, solidly since the mid 2000s, first surveys back in the 1980s, but uh, things just keep looking better. So that's really good news. But that is good. And I just posted that link for the enhancement tags, both in the Zoom and on Facebook. So um, if you guys did not get the email from us and are interested in purchasing a chance to 
win that ticket um, or that license, go ahead and, and apply there. Or I guess, I guess you're not really applying, you're putting in for the raffle, right? You're putting in for the raffle and like the department since uh, we all have a lot on our plates, we actually contract out the enhancement tag sales to, to nonprofit organizations. So for the Gould raffle and auction, both of them are through the National Wild Turkey Federation. The raffle is through the state chapter and the national is uh the national does the, the auction at their big convention. So both uh are also opportunities to hunt goulds in New Mexico. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, that's good. And I just saw to date that if you're a member of NWTF, you can get into this this year's convention for free for for that raffle so <laughs> so, awesome. so check that out yeah i just i got an email about it i thought that was pretty awesome so if you're a member make sure and check out the convention um and casey so you talked about the rio grands and where where can you find rio grands at sure it's a it's a question a lot of people ask who want to try and get both species in the state uh so their primary range uh, was actually along the Texas border. We think that originally they came into New Mexico from Texas. So natural river valleys would be like the Canadian River and the Pecos. And both of them, they're not very common because if you think about those, there's not a ton of roost trees, which are super important to turkeys. So uh, when I'm telling people potential Rio spots, I'm talking about like Tucum Carry area, there's some state land, there's some open gate, both got opportunities. And then um, they've actually been introduced into some other parts of the state. Um, the Rio Grande, now Rio Grande turkeys are there, so that's cool. <laughs> so if you're gonna try the Rio Grande, like hitting, this, I mean, Bosque del Apache has super healthy populations. So trying to get around there, maybe North Elephant Butte, around Socorro, those all provide some opportunities for Rios. Wonderful. And can you get a Rio over the counter after the draw or are those just over the counter tags? No, that's all, I mean, that's all over the counter. There might be like a WMA where Rios are on, the, I, I can't remember all the WMAs where, that are listed on the open list, but uh, pretty much all the draw hunts are Miriam's turkey hunts. So, yeah, awesome. so Rio, Rio Grande, over the counter. <laughs> <laughs> and even if you do, <laughs> excuse me, even if you do draw a turkey tag, I, I don't know if we'll talk more about the turkey draw. Um, some of the areas that you're putting in for is just like one turkey harvest limit. So you actually have another turkey tag that you could use uh, anywhere over the counter, so. So, and I do want to jump into the draw. So maybe that's a great segue and then we can come back to some of the, some of the other questions that we were going to talk about. But um, so in the areas, there's some areas where you can get two, if you put in for the draw, you can get two bearded turkey and some with just one. Um, but if you get a turkey tag, it's good for two turkeys, except for the, the gold raffle, obviously. But well, the, the Goulds enhancement tags are really cool because they come with the Goulds permit and then the two over-the-counter tags. So you actually get all three if you want. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a bucket list to hunt all three in one year. <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> and so what's the, what's the benefit of putting in for the, the draw if you can get the over-the-counter tags? Um, well, it really depends on where you want to go. So some of the areas are a, a little more, I guess, intensely managed because turkeys were either reintroduced there or um, the population is kind of low. So if you live by an area that's in for the draw, that's a, a good opportunity to hunt that area for a limited number of turkeys. Um, other things that the, the draw is helpful with, like... Oh, am I echoing? Sorry, it was my fault. <laughs> You're good. Sorry, no, so the draws, it also opens up some areas that wouldn't necessarily be available and over the counter. So for that, I'm talking about like Bias Caldera or the Vivadol. It gives hunters some opportunities to hit some of those uh, closed areas for turkey. So uh, it really depends on, on where you're interested in hunting, I think, uh, is, when you should think about putting in for the draw, because there are a lot of really good over-the-counter 
uh, opportunities as well. So. I thought that's interesting. And I put in last year for the, for one of the hunts, I can't even remember which one I put in for, but it was kind of, kind of a good idea. I looked at them and went, wow, this could be an opportunity for me to hunt in some of these areas that I may, may not get drawn for, for elk or for another species. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's, that's pretty cool. And if you do get, um, get a hunt in one of these, do you have to hunt in that area before you can go to a general, general um, over the counter season? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, we always want people to use their tag first if they do draw an area. Um, a, a lot of the times, some of the units in the draw are actually shorter than the general season. So it might be just a good idea to knock it off your list before heading out to over the counter, but it's not a requirement. So. Well, and the definite, a definite advantage to some of those draw areas is that you're going to have a lot less people out there as you at some of the the general public land areas there may be 50 guys hunting in a smaller area whereas on the the draw permit areas there's five or ten and that's the top yes. mm -hmm. that's an excellent point thank you rick that is i like to to get out and not see a whole lot of people <laughs> so that's well, great that, and, and turkeys get wise as soon as people start right. calling uh, they they kind of catch on to that, and so they know that they're not necessarily a hen sometimes, and so they get smart. So having a restricted number of people out there, like trying them, could also be very helpful. So. That's awesome. And it, we're talking a little bit about over-the-counter, and that literally means you could go through the online system or to um, a licensed selling vendor like Walmart and, and buy that license, right? Yes, exactly. And so you'll need the carcass tag or the, the e-tagging um, and you'll have the two carcass tags. And so as soon as you hear turkey, just notch it out. <laughs> and go for it. Um, and then, okay, so I'm gonna jump back into some of our questions. So over the counter, I think is a, a great opportunity. And, and what does it cost to put in for the draw? Is it, is it significant or, or what does it no. cost you to put in? No, it, it's really not too bad. So on um, a turkey application uh, is $7 if you're a resident and $13 if you're a non-resident. So uh, it's, it's not too bad if you think about that. And then the turkey license, which you would need to buy if you drew, uh, is $25. And so you get two bearded turkeys in the spring for that. Uh, so really, I mean, for two turkeys, they're pretty big birds. That's that's not too bad of a, a price. <laughs> so no, and you also have to to purchase your hunting license as well as the turkey tag, and and then whatever stamps you need. Yeah, but you can use that license for all the cool stuff like other resident gamers. <laughs> so <laughs> as someone who's never shot a turkey, I think that that's that they're pretty cool. <laughs> But hopefully I could get on some other resident game birds <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, so, so pretty affordable to put in for the draw. Um, and then, you know, if you're going to put in for the big game draw as well, then you, you already have been through that process and have your application started. Or you can do them both at the same time if you wanted to. So it's definitely a, a benefit. Um, and then I have a question. Um, if if somebody draws a bow hunt in the Sandias and they're unable to go, can they give that to a friend or donate it? Do you, do you know how that works? I don't know about donating. And turkey tags are a little bit different than big game tags. So um, I, I know that you can't just gift it over because there's a like numerical list of hunters and whoever gets that, the like drawn and so I think you might be able to call and like gift it back and the department could call like the next person on the list or give it to um, an org organization that allows people uh, like youth hunting and, and stuff like that so that might be an option your best uh, your best course of action would be to call the info center and ask licensing because I am not positive <laughs> But yes, you can always call the information center or um, shoot us an email um, at ispa, ispa at state.nm.us and we can we can answer that either through the email or through or through the phone center. So 
yeah, we, we will look into that and let you know, should that situation arise? <laughs> and then Casey, my next question for you, have you tasted a turkey? Yes, I think the wild turkey is really good. The legs are, are kind of tough because they have a lot of sinew. Just if you think about wild birds, they're walking all the time. They've got a lot of tendons in that leg. But um, I don't know, people pressure cook them. People do a lot of things with them to get the meat off. But I think wild turkey is good. <laughs> it's like I, chili stew. That's a great idea. <laughs> I think we actually have a couple of pretty good recipes that are on our magazine website through the department. So that, that could help get started if anybody is looking for some recipes. But um, my husband's favorite is like turkey and noodles. So he slow cookers the brass with, with like egg noodles and broth and it's good stuff. So Perfect. <laughs> awesome. So Casey, what mountain ranges do you find the Merriam turkeys in? Sure. So they're in most mountain ranges in New Mexico. Uh, if you, our, our primary range for them is going to be, there's a lot of birds in the Sacramentos and there's a lot of birds in the Gila. Um, and then there's some birds in the Guadalupes. They did occur there naturally. And then of course up in the Northern mountains. So really one of the only mountain ranges that they don't occur is in the Palencios. So uh, really, Marion's turkeys are pretty correlated with Forest Service land. So that's, uh, I mean, great public hunting opportunity. That, that is. That's in, so is there a natural barrier to keep them out of the, out of the boot heel? Um, no, besides <laughs> a lot of desert. So we haven't noticed any coming down. There's just a lot of, even like the Palencias on the northern end are so dry and turkeys need some groundwater, um, we think, and they need those roost trees. So where you run out of that, like at the northern end of, end of the Palencias, they're not really coming down out of the Gila. So hopefully they stay that way. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I, I hadn't ever thought about that, but that does make a lot of sense. <laughs> and, and so when you're hunting Merriams, you want to look for those big roost trees in the areas where they have good habitat, right? There you go. I, we're back. Oh, crows sure. or somebody okay. crows. What's the what's the best type of habitat to look for when you're hunting Merriams? Sure. So, like you mentioned, it's they they like those roost trees, and so when I'm thinking about Merriams turkeys, I'm thinking about ponderosa pines on a hillside typically because they're going to want to fly up into the roost tree at night and then fly down in the morning, and so. A lot of times during the season, they're going to want to fly into an opening and start displaying, well, especially the males are going to want to start displaying for the females right away. And so those like trees above, even just a small opening is a good place to start for Miriam's turkeys. Awesome. And um, so, okay, so getting a little bit into the, the like the species themselves, um, when do turkeys start breeding in New Mexico? That is a good question. And since we have like a pretty diverse state, if you think about how different the Sacramento mountains can be in weather versus the northern mountains, um, it, it definitely varies. And so that means the gobbling activity is going to vary as well. Um, turkeys tend to be, the males tend to be vocal at two peak periods. One is as hens are getting ready to nest. The guys want to show off their good stuff and be that breeding male. And then after the hens have started nesting, males are going to re-amp up and hope that like hens who have failed are going to come back out and look for a guy or that any hen that hasn't bred yet is going to look for a guy. So we tend to think that first peak is in like early April, probably like mid, like I, I think there was a study up in the sacks and it was like the 10th through the 15th was the first peak. And then the second peak was that beginning of May after a lot of the hens had like hit the ground nesting, so. And when you get a tag, the season, the turkey season's a fairly long season. It's not like a deer tag that's good for five days, right? 
Yeah, it's decently long. It's not quite a month. It goes from April 15th to May 10th. So there's usually four to five weekends in there that you can get out and try for a bird. Or weekdays. The mountains tend to be less crowded on weekdays. So don't forget that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Call, call in sick for a day or, or take a vacation day. <laughs> it's all worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then, Casey, can hens have beards as well? I, I know the rib says you can chew um, one or two bearded turkeys. So can hens have beards? Yes, they absolutely can. Um, and, and it's a little unnerving to see at first. So a lot of studies have estimated that actually about 10% of the hen population is bearded. And really, I mean, we like hunters to shoot the males because the females are what drives population growth. Uh, really, you just need one male and you can uh, get a lot of good nests out there. So, but yeah, hens with beards are open as long as it's visible. Wow, that's awesome. Um, okay, so I have a lot of questions. I'm gonna kind of bounce into um, some, of, some of them. Um, so right. it's a little bit all over the place, but. <laughs> So um, do, okay, so how do we count a turkey population? How do we get our estimates for turkeys? Sure. Um, so for like the, the highly managed Pell and CO's population, we're doing some GPS backpack work. And so we're really getting a lot of really good counts. Um, like we hit them up in the breeding season and in the winter when they tend to be congregated and you can get like a minimum population count uh, of, of a highly managed population. Across the rest of the state, uh, we don't really have the manpower for that kind of effort. And so what biologists have found is that about 10% of the population gets harvested every year. And so when we get the harvest numbers, uh, that's partially why harvest re reporting is mandatory. When we get those numbers, that's how we estimate up the population. And so we can kind of see fluctuations based on not only hunter success, but also how many turkeys are being harvested. Hmm. So. Interesting. <laughs> and do you know, I know you have been in the field and haven't been at your computer in a few days, but do you know if the population in the Zuni mountains is, is increasing or holding steady or decreasing? I have no idea. Um, I do know that they've done quite a bit of habitat work in there. And so I would estimate that it's probably helping population numbers. Uh, but like I said, that's just a guess. I can speak to it a little bit. I, the time I spent in the Zunis, there's <clears throat> the turkey population there hasn't changed much in 25 years. Um, they're, they're consistently in the same areas. Um, anywhere they do those habitat manipulation projects, particularly those, those fuel stinning projects, are probably going to get better for turkeys, particularly as the oak brush gets a little bit bigger and as some of those burns grow out, because there's been some pretty big burns. Um, but it's pretty good stuff for the most part. Hmm. That's good to know. Ricky, you are in the field more than just about anybody I know, I think. <laughs> I'm an Erin Tabouvier. She's in the field a lot looking at birds. <laughs> Yes. Well, in case every time I talk to you, you're headed out somewhere. So <laughs> a lot of times, yeah. <laughs> so, Casey, do you have any um, any either ancillary or direct knowledge of how drought in New Mexico affects wild turkey populations? Yeah, it's not great. Um, it definitely isn't great. This one hasn't been so devastating. We've had pretty decent uh, winter moisture as Rick and I were talking about before this call. And so turkey young is the most vulnerable age class. And so drought affects the insect growth and the like forbaceous uh, plants, which are like leafy greens or anything that's kind of flowering. And those are things that young chicks are gonna wanna eat. And so when we don't have insects and forbs because of drought, it's really hard on the young. And so hens may try to nest, but not many poults may make it into the population. So it can be pretty devastating. Right now, I don't think we've seen that yet. Um, but I mean, 
yeah, you never know when a, a terrible drought is going to occur for several years, so. Do, um, I was watching a webinar a while ago now with um, Oren, uh, our deer biologist, who'll be on in a few weeks, and um, the Mule Deer Foundation, and he was saying that deer can go several days without coming into water based on the weather, obviously. Are turkey the same way, or the, do they need, need water every day? Um, I would guess that they don't need it every day because they do get some water from uh, metabolism. And so the things they eat, they can break down and get metabolic water. Uh, but they, I don't know how long they can go without it, but probably a couple of days. I'm sure it would depend on the weather. Like, I mean, it's pretty chilly right now, so it's not, they're not getting dehydrated as fast. Yeah, that, that could be in their snow in some areas, especially up in the mountains. So that helps for sure. Perfect. Um, and then I think you touched on this, but, uh, the the babies needs insects um and let me see needs insects no rain and um to increase mortality um can you speak a little bit more about what the babies the the poults need um sure so so to get a really good reproductive effort into the population uh one after hen's nest so turkeys are ground nesting birds and so if it rains like crazy right after nests go down, that's really hard on, on populations. A lot or of times snows. it's, huh? Or snows during the nesting. Yes. So, I mean, if you think about that hen, she's trying her hardest and she's able to thermoregulate some, but she can't get too wet either because she also has to like keep herself warm. And so like you need a good nesting season with no dramatic weather effects and then once the chicks are little they're coming out and they're looking for insects so a lot of times it's grasshoppers or beetles or or pretty much anything that kind of scurries in front of them uh, is susceptible to eating and so they're eating insects a lot when they're young and then they start on like flowering plants like new grasses uh, they're switching over more to a plant-based diet, but even the insects will, I mean, even the adults will capitalize on insects if they're there. So. All right. And can you talk or, oh, or I, I'm not completely sure what the question is. I just have a Mount Taylor question mark unit nine. I'm guessing it's a, a reference that we made somewhere in here. I'm just not sure what it is. Um, do you know what's happening with the population around Mount Taylor? Rick might know. I know that there are turkeys there, and a lot of people like hunting that area. So, yeah, the Ignacio Chavez grant on the north side of Mount Taylor is pretty popular turkey area. Um, you know, as long as the access is decent, there the the turkey population up there similar to the Zunis. It it hasn't changed in 25, 30 years at this point to any great degree. It doesn't get a lot of hunting pressure, but you might have to work pretty hard to find birds. That's good to know. <laughs> and so we've talked a lot about um, hunting in the spring with the with the draw and with the over the counter. How does that affect the fall season? Can you harvest in both the spring and the fall, or um, what? What's the benefit to waiting to the fall season? Maybe. Um, the benefit. I mean it harvest in the spring doesn't really affect fall harvest and if you harvest or if you get a tag in the spring you can also get a tag in the fall um i don't know if there's a benefit for waiting for the fall but the nice thing is if you're out on like an elk hunt or if you're out hiking and you see turkeys in an area uh in either september with a bow or november with any legal sporting arm uh and you want to go and give turkey a try before Thanksgiving, uh, why the heck not? I mean, there's an opportunity if you know where birds are, but it's definitely different hunting strategies, hunting in the spring versus hunting in the fall. <laughs> so can you, it, so is it two bearded turkey a year or, or does that harvest limit change? If you get a uh, Sure, it's two bearded in the spring. And so then in the fall, it's actually any turkey. So beard, no beard, uh, it's just one bird uh, and it could be any turkey. So it would be legal to harvest two in the spring and one in the fall. So three total, if you like turkey 
a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Very interesting. And then Casey, um, one of the things that you had mentioned in our notes um, is how to scout using aerial imagery. Can you touch on that a little bit? It sounds fascinating. Sure. So uh, I, when I'm first looking at an area, I'm looking at maps with terrain and I'm looking at maps with aerial imagery. And so, like I mentioned a little bit ago, you want some terrain, especially if you're hunting Miriam's turkeys. And so you're going to want for like slopes and then you're gonna to wanna to look for a bottom. And so in the aerial imagery, I'm looking for, like I said, those slopes and open bottom. Uh, Rick mentioned a little bit ago, like clearing uh, or thinning work in the zoonies. So if you do find some area that looks like maybe it has a little less tree density, that's worth a shot. Um, but yeah, I'm looking at like nice tree slopes with open meadows when I'm starting to look at aerial imagery. Where are you getting that from? Are you using a specific app or a web program? I use Google Earth, but like Google Maps has pretty good imagery as well. So, I mean, basic, like any, any old person with a computer can get on imagery like that, which is helpful. So. Or if the hunting public, Hunt on X has also got satellite versus um, every other kind of imagery you could look for, and it's a fantastic app. I do love Onyx, but you have to pay for it. Yes, so. you do. <laughs> so the great thing about Onyx is they are one of the companies that has partnered with the department. And so anybody who applies for the draw before, before for the big game draw before March 10th will get a discount to Onyx. And they've also donated um, some larger membership packages for, for some of their other programs. Um, to, I believe it's three lucky people. So if you apply early, you'll get a discount code for Onyx. <laughs> so That's thank you guys. <laughs> there is. And, and I should mention, we're going to have information on the website soon, but um, we have several other companies. Um, Vista Outdoor Group and Federal Ammunition have done the same where they're going to give us discounts and, or not us, they're giving um, people who apply early discounts. Um, and Sportsman's Warehouse, Surf and Turf in Albuquerque, and I'm forgetting someone, Henry Rifles donated a rifle. So we'll have several packages available to people who apply early. So don't delay. <laughs> get your, um, do your bear turkey and your big game at the same time. So you can get into that, that as well. Um, yes, and what Michael, who's in the Zoom, he mentioned that Hunter Ed instructors also get great discounts for Onyx and other companies. So absolutely, thank you for being a volunteer, Michael. So Casey, we've talked a lot about turkeys, but have you, have we missed anything that you can think of? Um, no, not that I know of. I mean, I, I like to just throw out there, like if you do have questions, you can absolutely call the department, even if you think of them after this Facebook webinar. Like we like to help people out and we wanna try and, and help people be successful and have a good time. So you can always contact later. So. Absolutely. And, and okay, so I am double checking to make sure I didn't miss any questions. Oh, one point I did want to mention, um, if for the fall hunt, there are several units that are closed and some of the WMAs that are closed. So make sure if you are going to hunt turkey in the fall to double check that list of closed areas. Um, but I thought it was a great point. I had an elk tag last year and uh, it was in October, so I couldn't have hunted turkey, but I saw turkeys and thought about going back out and just couldn't make it happen. But <laughs> uh, year. next year, <laughs> but to some saw, guy, oh, go ahead, Rick. Sorry, I saw a question too that came up. Um, somebody was asking if you can hunt the Rio Grande and yes, you can. There's a lot of, there's a lot of public access in the Rio Grande. The middle Rio Grande Conservancy District has yeah. control of a lot of it. And I don't know how that works and how that whole access thing works, but there's quite a few birds in that corridor, anywhere from Boleyn all the way down to the top end of Elephant Butte. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out where you can hunt and you can definitely hunt them there. That's such a good point, Rick. Um, I think you have to go to one of their offices and, and purchase a key uh if you want access to their land so but yeah there are there are a ton of good opportunities there 
Yeah, and you can walk in on a lot of it without getting a key. Back when I was playing Game Warden a long time ago, um, they, they, it was still the same system then. People could purchase a key that, and they did it for an annual basis or something like that. But there's a lot of good spots. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So uh, for a quick wrap, wrap up, and Casey, you're more than welcome to stay. I know you have some miles to put on as well. So oh, we understand no, no, no. if you need to go. <laughs> Um, but it, it's a great opportunity to apply for the turkey draw, which the deadline for that is February 10th. It's two weeks from today. So, um, and it does close at 5 p.m. So if you guys are thinking about putting in, make sure to put that on your calendar to get your application in before February 10th at 5 p.m. Um, for that draw. And that can be either one or two of your of your bearded turkey limits. So double make sure and make sure and take care take that opportunity. It's seven dollars for a resident and thirteen for a non-resident. So there's not a whole lot to lose there by applying. Um, and then don't forget about fall turkey because that could give you another one. And lastly, I want to throw in one more plug for the enhancement tag that we are that we have um, partnership with the National Wild Turkey Federation to, to raffle off because that's kind of a hunt of a lifetime. I know many people that have been putting in for years and years and years in Arizona. Um, so getting that, getting that opportunity is a, a huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. And, and I think that the Goulds are really cool. I spent a lot of time with them and their terminal band is so white and they're just beautiful. So it's an awesome opportunity. <laughs> I'm hoping next year I can go on the surveys with you. <laughs> Get some yes. <laughs> Good. Cool. Well, I don't, I do want to jump over so we can talk a little bit about bears tonight because they are also in the application period that closes on um, February 10th at 5 p.m. So Rick, I, I know you do all kinds of stuff, but one of the biggest hats you wear is, is our bear biologist. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> short and sweet not like you to have a short answer <laughs> um but let's let's jump right in and there's also over-the-counter and draw um hunts that are available for bears in new mexico correct yep well uh, basically there are a number of draw hunts that are mostly open to residents only but there are a number of other opportunities those draw hunts are in sort of premier wildlife management areas and mostly in the northern part of the state. They are good opportunities, good numbers of animals, and you cannot use dogs in any of those areas. And they, they also are the month of August. So they start on August 1st, go through August 31st. They are a good opportunity to go out and spot and stalk a bear. Most of these areas are, are pretty good. There's a lot of open areas where the bears will be feeding primarily on acorns and berries at that time of year, especially in the beginning of August, they'll be on choke cherries and raspberries and whatever other berries may occur. Um, so those bears can be easily glassed up from a distance and you can make a stock on them and, and attempt to harvest one. Um, any of those wildlife management areas are all in the proclamation. I don't want to list them off because it's somewhat complex, but they're, 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 they're all good opportunities. The, the numbers of animals are very good. Um, we don't harvest bears the rest of the time in any of those areas. And so they're, they're, they work as de facto refugia where the bears are not harassed most of the year. Um, I'm not sure where else to go with that. <laughs> Perfect. So, so you can apply for the draw. Um, can you apply for the draw? And if you aren't successful in that draw hunt, hunt statewide? Yeah, it, it, the, the draw hunt is the same as any, any draw. Basically, you, you put in $7 for a resident to, for the opportunity to potentially get one of these special hunts that start August 1st versus waiting until August 16th or, or bow season in most of the state. And, uh, and that, that, that's just a special permit that allows you to hunt one specific wildlife management area or special management area. And the rest of your, your bear tag is still your bear tag. You, you just need the bear tag hunting license or hunting and fishing license and your appropriate stamps. And then you can hunt anywhere in the state uh, during any of the bear seasons in areas that are still open. Uh, realize that bear seasons, um, just like cougar seasons, because I also deal with those, any of the, the management zones within the state, they do have harvest limits and we close them as they get filled. So it's really important to stay on top of that. It's also a legal requirement. 
And there, there is one draw hunt that's in the spring, is that correct? That's correct. We have a, a draw hunt for the Valle of Adal, um, management area, which is forest service, um, up in the northeast portion of the state near Raton. Excellent opportunity. The, the historical, we've had this hunt for 10 or 12 years now. Historically, the harvest has been really low on the spring hunt. Um, we initially started it in order to, we have found during, with a bunch of research that we've done that the bears are actually causing a lot of calf mortality in that specific area. And so we were trying to get people to harvest bears, particularly male bears, in order to try and curtail some of that calf mortality. There hasn't been a lot of harvest in this hunt. So it's, I, I think it's underutilized to a certain extent, but a lot of that has to also do with the access. Um, it starts April 15th, it goes through May 20th. And April 15th, you can't drive to Valle Vidal a lot of times. Um, but by May 20th, you generally can. And most of the harvest has always occurred in the last week or two of that hunt. And the harvest has been pretty insignificant for a long time. And uh, it sounded like most of the harvest happens right at the end of the hunt, right? So if somebody does get that tag, they should kind of schedule that last weekend. <laughs> yeah, well, it's worth, it's worth going out and looking earlier if you can get up there. And if you can, I mean, at that time of year, there's, there's generally snow. Um, if, if there's not snow when you get there, it's going to snow by the time you leave. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty snowy part of the state. And, and at that time of the year, there's, we have a lot of weather typically that leaves a little bit of snow here and there. And then there's old snow always around still. Um, if you can find fresh prints in the snow, that would be an area to start. And those bears at that time of year are going to be utilizing basically green forbs. Um, as Casey was talking about earlier, is all the forbaceous materials, dandelions, clovers, things like that. These little species of not grass, but green stuff that come up early and in, can include young grass as well. But bears basically graze like a cow at that time of year. There's not a lot else unless they find a, a winter killed elk carcass or something like that. Very interesting. And, and okay, so most of the hunts we have are in the fall. So some you can get into a little bit early, um, but we did have a a change in some of our fall bear hunts. Um, I know some of them used to be in August and they've moved those dates. Can you talk a little bit about that and why they were moved? Well, there's, there's a couple different, in the southern part of the state, during August, it's extremely hot, basically. We, we started those hunts on August 16th through the beginning of bow season. Um, and we're allowing hound pursuit and everything at, in those southern units. Um, those have stopped because of the perception essentially that it's too hard on both the bear and the dogs uh, that people are using to pursue. Most, of, most bears are harvested with the pursuit of hounds. And by most, I mean 60 to 70% annually. Um, that it, it's tough on the bears, especially if it's a bear you're gonna chase and not harvest. Um, it can be really rough on them, and especially if they've run a long ways from water, and it's a kind of a time of the year when there's not a lot of food resources available. So it's been felt by a lot of people that this was not fair and or good for either the bears or the hounds that are chasing them. So it was a good opportunity to move it a little bit later. I, I do get a lot, I hear a lot of comments about, about that change, but. Um, yeah. Also, I mean, we were, we were filling up more than 50% of the bear harvest during that period for that, for basically in the Gila region, we were filling up more than 50% of the bear harvest at that time. And it, it, I, I'm, you know, I don't know all of the rationale behind it, but basically it was, it was putting a lot of pressure on things at that time. Now it provided an excellent opportunity because it was a time when nothing else is really open. However, it was warm and it was difficult on the animals. Okay. Thank you. I, I, I'm sure you get that question a lot. Way more than you want to know. <laughs> and you mentioned you can um, use dogs to hunt bears in New Mexico. Is there any place where you can or, or cannot use dogs in, to hunt bears? Wildlife management areas, you're not allowed to use dogs. Um, there may be other areas but they are not anything that are controlled by either Game and Fish or the feds on any of the federal lands or state lands. 
Um, but there are definitely in, within private property, if you have permission to hunt it, some people may not want, it, want you to use hounds. There's also a lot of places where I would not suggest you use hounds because dogs are not under your control once you let them loose chasing a bear or a cat. They are going to go where they go. And if the bear or the cat go onto somebody's private property or something like that, it may become an issue to retrieve those animals, your dogs and anything that it's been chasing. And that would be just because you don't have written permission, correct? Exactly. You have to have written permission to get on, go on to any private property at any time. And that is somewhat hard to get in a lot of parts of the state. Yes. So you can use dogs, but can you bait bears in New Mexico? I know there's other states where you can. No, absolutely not. We don't allow any baiting at all of any kind for any wildlife species. That's a great, a great point. Yeah, not just bears, but deer and uh, turkeys. You can't bait any of them. <laughs> awesome. Um, so most of the fall bear, most of the bear hunts are going to be in the fall. Um, what are some tips and tricks that you have for hunting bears? Uh, and dogs definitely benefit, but what's the best way to go about it if you're going to spot and stalk? Yeah, if somebody's interested in spot and stalk hunting, and and that's what I prefer personally. Um, what I would do is. Find out what they're eating, what they're eating, what they're feeding on at that in that given year. Um, if there's a good acorn crop, they're going to be in the acorns first of all. Um, if it's a in the south, particularly if it's a good prickly pear year, they're going to be eating prickly pears. Um, and after they've gone after they've gone through the available acorns, they're going to move to the prickly pears if they're still around, or vice versa. Um, otherwise, they eat a lot of juniper berries. It's amazing how a large animal like that can subsist on something that doesn't have a lot of nutrients, but they eat a lot of them. If you find a place where a bear's been eating a lot of juniper berries, it's real obvious he's been around. Um, he leaves leavings everywhere, but uh, in, in huge piles. <laughs> but uh, you know, they're, whatever they're eating at any given time in the fall, which is as, a general rule. It's going to be acorns primarily and first choice. Um, pinion nuts will also be there if, if there's pinion nuts available. You know, that, that's an on and off situation in most of New Mexico. Um, juniper berries, prickly pears, if there's any choke cherries or, or raspberries or anything like that, those are excellent areas to look. There will be bears feeding on them even though you can't see them. So the bears are a lot like me. So if you follow the food, you're going to find a bear. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so um, we did have a, a really cool article. I don't know if you've had a chance to see it because I know you've been out in the field, but we, um, in the January newsletter, um, and then we shared it on Facebook yesterday, we talked about a young girl who spot and stalked a bear and successfully harvested her first bear. Um, it, was, it was just her and her mom. So it was, I thought it was a really cool story and um, Huge kudos to her because it's something that I have never even dreamt of doing. So <laughs> she's 17. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah, a good friend of mine did it this year as well, this last season. But that, that's awesome. So it, it's doable. It's definitely doable. It's a challenge, but it's doable. It is. And and one of the things, if you're if you're going to try and spot and stalk bears, you know, first of all, find where they're feeding. Second of all if you have open areas within that area where you can spend some time glassing and find an animal that you're interested in harvesting, bears are not particularly difficult to stalk close to. Keep the wind in your favor, don't be too noisy. They make a lot of noise when they're feeding themselves. They're crunching stuff constantly. And they, they, they move, they use their paws to move the brush and the leaves and the litter around to get at what they're looking for. And so they, they actually make quite a bit of noise. And Getting close isn't horribly difficult. Um, and then you do what you need to do. <laughs> and take care of it. So if you do harvest a bear, um, there, there's a pelt tagging process. Can you walk us through step-by-step step how that works? Um, and we, we have a couple of questions. Is there an extra instructional booklet to go along with it? And um, can they be seized if they don't go through this process? So can you walk us step by step through that pelt tagging process? Yeah, so the pelt tagging process is actually pretty simple. Um, once you harvest an animal, tag it with your physical tag or the e-tag option um, and take your animal out of the field. 
you are required to present a bear or a cougar tag. I'm always going to throw cougar in there as well because I'm the bear and cougar biologist and this process is quite similar for the two of them. But once you you have to once you have your pelt and your skull, you need to present that to us within five days in order for me or one of the other one of our officers or another biologist to put a pelt tag on it. The pelt tag is a physical tag. It's a green. It's called a truck seal. Um, it's a it's a one way you put the thing in and it can't be undone. Um, the little lock zip tie kind of lock thing essentially. Um, and what that, and it has a number on it, an individual number that will designate that your bear has been tagged by uh, game and fish personnel. Um, and that lets the taxidermist or wherever it eventually ends up know that it's legally taken. Um, this is also most of the big game species and turkeys for Casey's benefit there. Um, are you, are you're required to do a harvest report. With bears and cougars, we don't require a harvest report because if you harvest one, you're required to have it pelt tagged. So we're getting rid of part of the process because it's not necessary. If you harvest one legally, you have to present it anyways. But you bring that to us within five days, we put the pelt tag on it, we take some data. We're gonna take a tooth, a very small tooth. It's not, part, not gonna ruin your trophy, guys. Um, a very small, a premolar that is not, it's a vestigial tooth that just isn't used for anything and you're not even going to notice its absence. Um, we'll take a little tiny bit of tissue. Um, we may take pictures or take a few hairs or something like that if we're doing some kind of study that requires that. But basically we're just going to look at it, make sure it's legal and let you go on your way. One of the important things on this is the proof of sex must remain attached to the pelt of the animal. The proof of sex can include female genitalia, male genitalia, including the baculum if, it's, if you keep that. Um, and the skull and the hide must come together. So if you harvest one, you need to bring the skull, proof of sex, and the pelt. All attached. All attached. <laughs> well, the, the skull can be, can be removed from the hide, but you, it's gotta be with it still. Um, also, we, we, we really prefer that you not bring it frozen and that you have the jaw affixed open with a stick or a water bottle or something like that so that we can actually access that premolar in order to take it out. If it's frozen and you present it to us, I may tell you to go home and bring it back tomorrow when it thaws out because I can't get the tooth out without breaking it and that is a requirement. It actually says so in the proclamation. Can somebody take that tooth out and bring it to you or does that have to be removed by yourself or a, a biologist or an officer? In most cases, it needs to be removed by myself or an officer or one of the other biologists. Okay. Um, on rare occasions, we may go the other way if something weird happens, but it's, it's very rare. And so you have five days to report that harvest, is that correct? No, you have five days to bring it to us. Okay. Okay, now, Caveat here, um, it's COVID and so things are strange. There's actually a hotline that we have people calling at the moment in order to arrange for me or somebody else to arrange for you to meet somebody somewhere <laughs> because we're, none of our offices are open at the moment. So it's, I'm playing a giant game of phone tag and have been for about six months now. So, so call that number and we put it out on every harvest report, bear, cougar, that number's out there all over the place. It's in the regulation yeah. booklet. So make sure, I always tell people to program that number and the Operation Game Thief number into your phone and that way you have those should you need them. Really good idea also because you are required to check the harvest limits for bears and cougars before you hunt on a daily basis. Um, and let, you know, if you're in the wilderness in the Gila and you have no cell service, check it before you go, check it when you come out, but we, we don't require you to do the impossible, but you need to, you are legally required to check those harvest limits before you hunt um, on a daily basis, essentially, should you have access to a computer or a phone. I update the harvest limit information on the phone and on the internet at least two to three times a week, oftentimes more during the busy parts of the season as Tristana will let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I laugh because you'll send me an email and say, this unit's gonna close in the next couple of days. And then I almost always get an email from you saying that it's closed. <laughs> um, so if you don't go through this process and you, you don't get a pelt tag, can your hide, your pelt be seized? Yes, we're gonna take your bear or your cat away from you. Um, 
that basically is how it goes. If you, if you, if you don't follow the process as it's, as it is written in the proclamation, we will seize the tag, the, the hide. Okay. And then on that tooth that you pull, um, what information do we get about that bear from, from the tooth? Okay, we, we send those teeth off, um, and this is important to know for the few people that are actually paying attention, but uh, we, for both the cougars and the bears, what it does is it, we, we send those teeth off to a lab where they cut them into very small slices and then they read the age of the animal, which they read sort of like rings on a tree, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, we can tell a lot about the health of the population in general, and particularly the health of the harvested population by what the ages of those animals are. So over time, if the ages of the animals are raising or dropping, it gives us an idea of what harvest might be doing to that population. Um, there's a lot of looking at it in, in, in a number of different ways, but it gives us information that we require in order to do appropriate management for either species. Um, I send those teeth off basically once a year. Um, it happens right about now. I'm waiting on contracts at the moment in order to actually end and waiting on a few extra samples to arrive. And I'll send them out now. And I, I have the bare results from the 2000, what are the 20, 2020, 2021 season. I will have those results. And generally in May is when the lab usually gets them back to me. The cougars will be from the preceding year. They'll actually be from the 2019, 2020 season. Cougars take a little bit longer because it's a year long season. We send all these teeth off at the same time because um, I hate to say it, but we get a volume discount on this. Mm -hmm. If you send a single tooth in to get aged, it's gonna cost you 40 bucks. If you send a thousand teeth in to get aged, they're about $5 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> so we're saving some money for, for licensed buyers by, by going that route. Correct. And it also, it basically, we, we, we get all the data at the same time, and it's a lot easier to manage that way try, than rather than piecemeal trying to put it in here and there later on. And the lab really, really likes big lots. They do not like single teeth. <laughs> they do. I, and I've seen a few of the slides. I think it's pretty cool. It's almost like looking at a, a tree ring where you can kind of see the, the age growth ring. I think it's really fascinating. And do you know what the oldest bear harvested in New Mexico is? Oh boy. Uh, interesting question. Um, yeah. Annually, we get bears that are 24, 25 years old. Um, the oldest one I've seen was 30. But the problem is with that, and the lab was quite <laughs> honest about this. They said 30 is a, a number for black bears that is almost unheard of other than captive animals. Um, and so we, we don't feel that maybe that this is completely accurate. Um, so there's caveats. The older the animal is, the harder it is to age it. Once more of the, the tooth is not big and it doesn't get larger. So those, those rings get compacted into a smaller and smaller space. And so it leaves a lot to be questioned later on down the road. Um, uh, the, the oldest cat I've ever seen was 15. And that's, that is very old. It basically didn't have any other teeth. It was a very old male that was caught in Farmington. It was, um, had, had moved on to chickens because it probably couldn't kill anything else. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. <laughs> Whoever asked that question, that was a great question because I, I learned way more, <laughs> so thank you. Um, and then we're gonna swing back to, we were talking about spot and stocking. And so you had mentioned that you stock in pretty close. Um, can you define what close is? Okay, hold on a second. I'll repeat that. I'm, I'm looking at questions and talking. And <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to my world. So when you're spot and stalking, uh, can you define what close is when you're when you stalk in and you're trying to get close to a bear? What would you say is close? Okay, close is close is a relative term. Um, close is a, a distance that you feel you can make a reasonable and lethal shot. So if you can get to within 100 yards, most people sight their rifles in at 100 yards. And you know that you can hit a, a target that's four inches across every time at 100 yards, that's the right distance. If you have a rifle that you are capable of shooting a little further, 
and you know you've practiced with it, you've done a lot of in the field shooting and things like that, maybe it's a little further out. But like I said, stalking a bear is not particularly difficult as long as it's not too loud and all these things. If there's background noise like wind, that can be a really big benefit. However, if the wind is swirling around, it's more likely to smell you and it's gonna skadoodle. Um, so close is, is, is one of those terms, it's relative. It, 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 as close as you're comfortable making a good and lethal shot. All right. That, that was kind of what I was thinking too, but I, I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad I'm on the same page as you. That doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay. So I'm um, going back to reporting a harvest. Uh, I mean, we were talking about hunters have to, um, to call in in the morning before they go out. Um, say, say I'm headed out um, into the Gila and I won't have cell service. So I, I call the latest I can. Um, there's, a couple of bears left in the harvest, harvest limit, and, and then I do end up getting a bear while I'm out, um, but I did not have cell phone service. Um, what happens then? That's why we have the rule as it is. And it's also why we close the harvest at 10% below the actual total limit. We, we leave a little bit of leeway there for situations just like that. We know there's gonna be people that are out of cell phone service and that don't have computer service that are going to potentially lag behind a little bit and we're trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. And so, you know, I, I, as, a, as a general rule, if there's two bears left on 156 bear limit, maybe don't shoot a bear. But uh, if there's 30 bears left on 156 bear limit, I would say, go ahead and harvest a bear. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a personal decision. Um, you're going to have to talk to a game warden at some point about this, and he may ask you some interesting questions. So do your best. <laughs> yeah, do your best. Yeah, but we, 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 we understand that, that you don't have cell service everywhere. You don't have a computer. You can't check things. This is, <laughs> New Mexico is, is an interesting place, and there's a lot of places where you don't have much of a cell signal at all. And uh, we know that there are going to be situations like that. And, and we want you to, to do your best to try and follow the rules. And if you, if you follow the rules to the word of the law, which you have, if you've checked it before you went, you've gone into the wilderness area, you're legal. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so I have a couple of questions about the bear population. Um, so on a statewide look, and then I also have a question about um, density in the Southern Sacramento's. Um, can you talk a little bit about population densities? Yeah, um, it's kind of interesting. You know, population densities vary widely across the state for a number of reasons and for you know, some of which we don't understand quite. But uh, there, are, there are definitely, there's different densities across the state. The northern portions of the state and the Sacramento's tend to have higher densities. However, research we've conducted within the last, oh, six or eight years has said that some of those Southern Sacramento densities are not as high as we had thought before. Um, not totally certain why, the, why that is the case. And so we, we adjusted harvest limits to account for those differences in what we were able to actually determine the population densities are. Um, I, the numbers are not on the top of my head. I did not expect this question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We'll prepare as much as we can. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but the, you know, the densities do vary across the state. We're currently engaged in determining the densities for the Gila region. Um, those results won't be out for a while yet. We, we still have a second year of, of hair collection to do. We literally collect bear hair using small barbed wire hair snares. Um, which involves a lot of hiking and really bad roads um, and, and donuts. <laughs> because we, we literally bait the bears in to come into these locations in order to climb through some barbed wire and give us some hair so that we can analyze that for DNA and determine what, what that, who that bear is. And, and the more places that particular bear goes, the more of our snags he visits or she visits, and the more times they visit them, the better the information is. So these are pretty intensive studies. It's myself and a crew of five or six other people. And we spend May through 
the cat's at the door. <laughs> we spend May through uh, through August out in the field and and setting these snares and baiting them and collecting the, the samples once a week um, in order to try and determine what these population numbers are. It's, it's actually a lot of fun. Um, of course, the 15th hike into the same location becomes less than fun. Um, but that's, that's one, of the, what, what we're, one of the things we're doing in order to get better density estimations. Those density estimations are what we base the management on. So if you look at one area of the state and if you say, well, why is there so many here and so little there? Well, it's based upon how many bears we have estimated live in that area. We're always, we're always learning. It's fascinating to me. Okay, uh, a, what, a legal question. Um, can you use an electronic collar to harvest a bear or a mountain lion? Mountain lions, yes. Um, I don't know for bears at the moment. We may have changed that law recently. <laughs> That's okay, and, and that's a great point because the rules and information booklet changes annually. And so we recommend people d double check it and, and see what changes are made. Yeah, actually it's, it's every four years for bear and cougar stuff generally, mm -hmm. unless something major happens. For instance, we get results of, of this bear study that we're currently engaged in. If it shows that we are over or underestimating the bear population dramatically, we'll have it changed the next year essentially. But, we try to change, make major changes every four years. Um, and I, the electronic call question is excellent and I don't know the answer to it right now. I know that you can use them for cats. Perfect. Okay, and then a couple of, I have one mountain lion question. Um, how often do you think a mountain lion makes a kill? All right, <laughs> research-based. Um, the, the, the general rule of thumb is that a, a lion makes a kill once a week. Wow. Um, now that, that there's a lot of caveats attached to that. Female mountain lions that are feeding kittens, they make a kill once a week or darn close to it or else they can't feed the kittens and they can't raise them up and, and provide them with milk and nutrition until they can kill on their own, which takes about 18 months. So they, you know, they have to kill a lot more often. Whereas a male cat, can go a long time between kills. He generally, they generally kill larger animals. Um, male cats are more liable to kill a bull elk, for instance. Um, female, a 90 pound female cat has a lot of trouble killing a bull elk, whereas a 130 pound tom can do it a lot more easily. Doesn't seem like it, the, the difference doesn't seem extreme, but it makes a huge difference. Um, and he will tend to kill less often because he's not interested in, the meat so much as he's interested in finding that female cat and for a mating opportunity. So males move across the terrain looking for females, whereas females look, move across the terrain looking for places that they can effectively raise kittens where there's plenty of groceries. That's awesome. But the word of the, you know, the sort of rule is once a week, one, one deer sized animal a week, and that can be less or more often. Um, depending on situations. There's some habitat in the state where killing a deer once a week would be virtually impossible. There wouldn't be any deer left. Mm -hmm. um, coyotes, badgers, javelina, whatever have you, other available prey opportunities are there. Turkeys um, um, are also options. Wow, wow, it's like there's a little fight going on. <laughs> so it's all right. I know turkeys are a prey species. <laughs> Except for not quite as much as cottontails. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I feel like we would be remiss when we talk about bears. Um, one of the questions I get all the time are what species, what types of bears do we have in New Mexico? We have black bears, that's all. Um, However, black bears is a misnomer. Um, the black bear, it was called the American black bear by the, the first settlers that showed up in the Northeast, you know, Massachusetts or whatever. Um, my family came on that boat. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, they were, they're, they're all black. In the forested portions of the country, the bears are primarily black in color. Whereas in more open portions of the country, the bears tend to be a sort of a gamut of colors. They, they range from black anywhere to literally blonde 
Um, there's populations of bears that are white, of black bears that are white up in the Pacific Northwest in Canada. Um, there's one that's, they call it the blue bear, it's blue, the care mode bear that lives on an island off the coast of Canada. Um, you know, it's 30% of the population there and it's this crazy blue white color. Um, but they, you know, they can be a lot of colors. The primarily color, primary color we find in New Mexico is sort of a brownish bear. <laughs> it's sort of brown and red. Um, sometimes it has a blonde streak down its back. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a, a common color here. Um, we do have pitch black ones, but it's actually a fairly rare color phase here, whereas something brownish is a lot more common. That's awesome. And I feel like we'd be remiss. Um, I know most bears are, are hibernating right now, um, but there's a lot of stuff that people can do going into spring and into summer and as bears are coming out of hibernation to help the bears. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about bear safety and um, being bear wise? Always. Um, you know, yeah, bears are primarily in hibernation right now in the southern part of the state. You probably have some bears that are still wandering around and, and might do so all year. Bears hibernate because there is no food. Um, in the wintertime, they can't get around on snow. If they don't have food, they might as well be asleep. If they can do it, they should, I would too. Um, but when they wake up, they're gonna be hungry um, and they're going to, particularly in a drought year, like it looks like we're going towards they may cause the, the standard problems we hear about, bears getting into garbage, bears getting into beehives, things like that. The best thing a person can do to avoid those problems is just to not have attractants in their yard or in places where they have, wherever that might be, a barn, a ranch, anything like that, to avoid having attractants where bears can get at them, have anything, trash, uh, sweet feed, corn, anything like that, locked up in a place where a bear can't access it. Um, then you, there's sort of the standard rules. Put your trash out the day of pickup instead of the night before. Um, any fruit, if you have apple trees, apricot trees, peach trees, things like that, when, when those fruit are ripe, gather them. Don't let them fall on the ground and rot because that really attracts the bears. If you have fruit trees or, or beehives, um, Put an electric fence around them, that'll keep the bears out. They really don't like electricity. It works really well on them. Um, barbecue grills and things like that that you have in the yard, keep them clean or keep them in the garage, better yet. Don't feed the pets outside. If you have a water feature or something on your property and you live in bear country, expect visits, especially on a dry year. Um, when, when you do get those visits, understand what they're there for. They're there for the water. They're not there for something else, unless you have an attractant other than that. Um, if you have an old wood pile full of ants or something like that, a bear's going to tear it up looking for the ants. They eat a lot of ants. And they'll, they'll go after it. They'll go after the ants. They'll go after the mice and the wood rats that are also nesting in that wood pile. But they're probably going to move on down the road. Awesome. I, I get a lot of pictures every year of bears in backyards on the outskirts of Santa Fe and Albuquerque and some of our more rural communities. And I think anything we can do to help the bears move through um, and, and go eat natural food is a, is a good thing. Yep. Natural food is what we want. Um, okay. So our questions are dying down. I have one more in here. Um, and it's the same for bear and turkey, but if you apply, whether you're a resident or a non-resident, if you apply for the draw and don't get drawn, you are still eligible for the over-the-counter tags. Yes. Yeah, you can. Yeah. And, and, and also, if you do get one of those draw permits, you still, your over-the-counter tag is still viable. You can still use that anywhere where it's open in the state. Perfect. So, so why not put in? It's seven dollars for a resident, thirteen for a non-resident um, to to apply. Um, but I, Rick and Casey, thank you both for for coming in. Both of you have been in the field this week, and so I definitely really appreciate it. And by the number of thank you comments that I've gotten on Zoom and on Facebook, um, everybody else appreciates it as well. So thank you guys both for doing that. Um, and a quick reminder, the draw, the deadline to put in for the bear and turkey draw is two weeks from today. So it's March, I'm sorry, February 10th at 5 p.m. And the, um, 
big game draw for elk, deer, oryx, pronghorn, bighorn sheep. I'm missing a couple. <laughs> that draw other is, stuff. what's that? Ibex. Other stuff. <laughs> Ibex, other stuff, exactly. <laughs> that draw deadline is March 17th at 5 p.m. Um, so thank you guys very much. Sorry, my dog thinks it's dinner time. <laughs> Thank you everyone out there on Facebook and in Zoom for joining us. And thanks again, Rick and Casey for, for your evening. And drive safe, Casey. Oh, thanks, Tristana. <laughs> right. Bye everyone. Thank you everybody for coming. <laughs>